Good evening, everybody. Good to see you tonight. Thank you for joining us for our family enrichment service, our midweek Bible study. We're excited that you're here and looking forward to lesson number three in our study on footprints of faith. We have been enjoying this journey through the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to jump right in here in just a moment. We want to have prayer tonight and ask God's blessings. Uh, just got word a few minutes ago that Dr. Brian's grandmother passed away last night, and his grandfather is in the hospital and not expected to live, so he'll be leaving on Friday to head to Louisiana for the funeral. Let's be praying for that family that they'll have safe travel and that the Holy Spirit will comfort them. The pastor is recovering from his second eye surgery. He, is, he was actually at dinner uh, tonight and just continue to remember him in prayer that he'll have a, a speedy and a quick recovery. And uh, if you have a special need, just signify that need by lifting your hand. God knows what it is. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come together tonight in our Bible study. We just ask that your Holy Spirit will illumine the Word of God to us, that you will shine your light on the Scripture, and let it be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We ask that you will minister healing to those that are sick, those that are struggling, and I ask, God, that you will lift them up. God, be with Brian and his family as they travel. Keep them safe and bring them back to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. If you have your Bibles, go with me, please, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. If you don't have an outline, I do have some here if you would like to come and get one. And uh, if you want to follow along in the outline, you're welcome to do that. Hebrews, chapter 11, and verse number 7 says, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. And by his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now the other passage, I'm not going to take time to read it tonight, but Chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9 in the book of Genesis tells us, of course, the story about Noah and how that uh, he spent 125 years building an ark at the obedience of God's command and his word. And for the past three weeks, we've been looking at some men who were very, very ordinary, but they were people who had an extra nor extraordinary experience with God because they demonstrated reckless faith and unreserved commitment to God. I said earlier in this study that the Holy Spirit loves to teach truth and communicate faith by clothing it in flesh and blood. Amen? In other words, he likes to use us, flesh, people, ordinary folks, to demonstrate his power and to reveal the truth of the Word. In our previous two lessons, we studied men from the primeval period, which are the days that were before the flood. In Hebrews chapter 11, the writer, he actually invades, and I talked about this in the introduction four weeks ago, he invades five different periods of Israel's history as indicated. We had, first of all, the primeval period, which is the period before the flood. We have the patriarchal period. We have the exodus period. And then we have the conquest of Canaan, and then lastly was the period of the judges and the kings. And thus far in our study, we were introduced to Abel and to Enoch, and tonight in this lesson, we're going to look at the life of Noah. The world is not interested in hearing our rhetoric, but they want to see the Christian faith lived out and walked out and fleshed out in our everyday lives. I heard somebody say it this way. You are the only Bible that some people will ever read. Think about that. You're the only Bible that some people will ever read. People are looking at us, wanting to see how we respond, how we react, how we talk, how we live when we get hard-pressed. We all know that the world is trying its best to squeeze us into its mold. But we have to be able to live by faith, walk by faith, and trust God 
in every situation. What a man that Enoch was. We talked about him last week and how that he walked with God for 300 years. And tonight we're going to talk about a different aspect of faith. When we talked about um, in our earlier lesson and we, and we discussed Abel and we talked about the aspect of faith worshiping. And then last week as we looked with, at Enoch, we talked about faith what? Walking. And tonight, as we look at the life of Noah, we're going to talk about the aspect of faith at work or faith working as we look at him. We understand that Noah was the grandson of Methuselah, and he was the great-grandson of Enoch. And in order to have a balanced faith, our faith has to first of all worship, it has to walk right, and our faith also has to be active. Our faith has to do something. Faith must work. The Holy Spirit has zeroed in on the personality of Noah to demonstrate to us that faith works because this is the only faith that pleases God, isn't it? In Hebrews chapter 11, he says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Jesus said that faith without works is graveyard dead. I added graveyard in case you didn't know that. But faith without works is dead. And in fact, the writer of the New Testament said this, you show me your faith by your works and I'll determine that you've got the real stuff. Right? The Bible tells us that the end of our faith is the salvation of our soul. It's not how we start. It's how we finish. And here's the question that Jesus asked. I believe it was in Matthew 23 or 24. He says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? That's a huge question. You know, there is a lot of people today losing heart, losing faith, because of the culture around us. We're asking ourselves questions. Well, how do we respond to this? And how do we, we, how do we go about living a faith walk in the midst of, of a society that's anti-faith and anti-God. Well, we're going to look at this tonight in the, in, the, in the life of Noah and how that his faith worked for a hundred, think about this, 125 years. The amazing thing about the story of Noah is that as far as we know, there was never any record of rain or a flood ever in history. And yet God comes to this man, an ordinary guy who has a family of a total of eight people and tells him, build me an ark. Okay, what for? Well, it's gonna, I'm going to flood the earth and destroy the human race. And the only people that, the only people that will survive are the ones that are going to be in the safety of the ark that you build. Now think about that for just a moment. How hard would it be for you to respond to such a demand on your faith when there's no history of rain in all of the earth because up until that time, you know, mist came up from the earth. It didn't rain. The mist came up from the earth in the Garden of Eden in paradise. And now he's talking about building this massive ark and it takes the guy 125 years to do it. You see, one of our problems in the church today is that we have a lot of folks that have been immunized and inoculated with just a little bit of religion. But they don't have the real thing. We need people who have real, authentic, genuine faith. So we're going to talk about faith working tonight. And I've got to confess to you that I have a problem with laziness. I didn't get a single response to that one. I have a problem with laziness. In fact, I know why the early fathers included in their list of deadly sins the word sloth or slothfulness. You know what that word means? Lazy. If you're slothful, you're lazy. I, I kind of doubt, and I'm gonna, I may get in trouble with this next statement, but I'll try to defend it the best I can if I need to. 
but I kind of doubt that lazy people will be in heaven. If slothfulness is a deadly sin, and the Bible says sin cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, well, you put two and two together yourself. I have problems with people affiliated with the church who say they have faith, but their faith won't get them out of bed on Sunday morning to attend church. Or their faith won't get them in the baptistry to be baptized as Jesus commanded them to be in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Or their faith won't get them to tithe. Or their faith won't get them to join the church or be involved in the ministry. They believe, but their faith is dead. Faith without is, say it again, faith without works is dead. Now, Noah's story is outlined for us in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. And I highly recommend it for your reading because it is intensely exciting and educational. And these four chapters are actually microscoped in one verse found in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. Let's go back there again and read it one more time. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now notice in this verse that Noah's faith that worked, it built an ark by which he and his family were saved from the flood. And one thing I learned quite some time ago as a young minister many years ago, it doesn't matter which seminary that you graduate from or what professors taught you about church growth and how to build a great church, no one is ever going to build a great work for God sitting on their sit-down. We've got to be active and work. You've got to be a doer and not just a follower. You've got to be a doer and a giver, not a chief and a taker. One thing that I despise, um, and I've been in ministry 40 years, so I've been around the block a couple of times, and one of the things that I despise about some of my peers is that they think that they can lay in bed until noon every day and build a great church for the kingdom of God. Some preachers really believe the only thing they have to do is preach on Sunday. No, a balanced faith Faith requires movers and shakers. It requires us to be busy and to be about the Father's business. A friend of mine many years ago made this statement as he told the story of a church growth book that he had picked up at a library to read. And the title was, One Step to Church Growth. Well, being the church growth advocate that he is, he couldn't wait to open the book to find out what the author author would disclose as the one-step procedure. I mean, usually when you get a book like that, it's 10 steps or 20 steps to church growth. And he opened the book, and in bold letters were three words, go to work. You see, the Bible has a lot to say about laziness, doesn't it? I believe it's found in the book of Solomon. It's addressed, the wise man. We find it in other places, both in the Old and the New Testament. So let's have some reali reality therapy here for just a moment. If we're going to plan to build a progressive and a thriving, growing church here at New Life Worship Center, and we're going to build on this foundation that has been laid we're going to have to get busy. We're going to have to beat the pavement. It's got to be more than just attending church on a Sunday or a Wednesday. We've got to be busy. Did you know that the most churches in our denomination do not even have multiple ministry staff? But listen to me. If we're going to pull this thing off and we're going to build what God wants us to build here in this city, we're going to have to work. We're going to have to do it diligently. We're going to have to do it long. We're going to have to do it hard. It's hard work. Ministry is not easy. You know, my dad, I'll have to tell you the story. My dad was not saved until his dying breath at age 60. 
when he passed away of a heart attack, but he called upon the name of the Lord in the last few breaths that he took on this side. And thank God, it was a promise that God had given me when I received the call into the ministry. My grandfather was a backslidden Church of God preacher, and my dad had never been saved his whole life, even though he was raised in the church. And I had had a a vision that if I would be obedient to the call of God upon my life, God promised me the salvation of my father and my grandfather. Both of those men died or got saved in their dying breaths, both, my father and my grandfather. How many of you know God's faithful to his promises? Amen? And so what we have to understand, and I lost my train of thought there for just a moment, We have to work hard, we have to work diligently, and we have to work long. And we have to understand that when when we are going to do the work of God, the Bible says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your what? With all your heart. You've got to have your heart in this. It can't just be half-hearted. How many of you know that those projects that your wife wants done at the house don't get done if you do it half-hearted, does it? But no, if she lights a fire under your feet, you're going to get them done, but you're you're going to have to be diligent about it. I mean, who told you just because, and I'm talking to people who, I'm, I'm referring to these peers of mine, that think just because they went to college and they graduated from seminary, that they can go to a pulpit on Sunday morning and that's just going to automatically fill up their church. Wrong. We have to be diligent. And I, as your pastor and leader, I've got, to have, I've got to be the one that sets the example. I mean, I can't expect anybody in this church to work if I'm going to sit in my comfortable office, recline back in my chair. If we call a work day around here, guess who has to be here with a paintbrush and a broom and a mop? Okay? I have to lead by example. And I want to be an example of the believer in diligent work. Why? Because our faith must work. If it doesn't work, it's not effective. It's dead. I've got to be an example. If we call a prayer meeting here on a Saturday night, guess who better show up? Me. If we have revival, guess who should be here when the doors are open? Me. Me. When we worship in our church during Sunday morning, I want to be the first one to show my tithe and offerings going into the bucket. Why? Because I have to be an example. So there are two things I'd like to underscore from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, and these two truths are what I want us to learn from tonight from our lesson. Two things I want us to look at. First of all, I want us to look at the essentials or the components of faith. And then secondly, I want us to address the effects or the results of faith. Now understand, these two things are divine principles, and these principles, these components and results, will work in the arena of your life as well. So let's take number one, the essentials of faith. There are three essentials that I want to address tonight, or components of our faith. And what I'm trying to do in this study of Hebrews chapter 11 is to develop and to infuse your faith. I want your faith to grow. Why? Because everything that you and I receive from God, we receive by faith. Faith is indispensable in our walk with God. And in verse 6, the word declares that it is absolutely impossible. Look at it. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone that comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So let's look at the three components of our faith. The first of all is there is the intellectual component. And I'm going to talk about that here in just a moment, the intellectual component. Secondly, there is the emotional component to our faith. And thirdly, we'll close with the volitional component. Let's talk about the intellectual component. Go back with me again to verse number 7, and let's break this down for just a moment. Listen what it says. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen. Now, it's unfortunate that Christianity has gotten a bum rap. What do I mean? A lot of times today in this society... 
Believers are characterized as those who have committed intellectual suicide. Where the, you know, Christianity is the non-thinking man's religion. That's what, a, that's what this society thinks. The world says that if you're going to be a Bible-believing Christian, you might as well just put a bucket on your head and take a 357 Magnum and shoot the bucket. The world thinks that if you go inside a church, you got to check your brains in at the front door. Okay? That's what the world sees us as. They don't understand that our faith is not based upon a farce. Our faith is not just some intangible thing that we've pulled out of nowhere to believe in. There is an intellectual component to our faith because nothing could be further from the truth than when you go to a church that you've got to check your brains in at the front door. So I want to disclose the intellectual component of our faith. And it's high time that Christians come across loud and clear to this educated intellectual society that our faith is based upon firm Factual foundation. Amen. I'm getting excited. You'll discover in this passage of Noah's experience that his faith was firmly rooted in fact. Not human fact, but divine fact. Not in reason, but in revelation. We need to communicate this message to our generation today. I shared the story about my son who said to me many years ago about when he was, I don't know, 19, 20, 21, Dad, I don't believe in your religion. I said, oh, really? What do you believe? Well, I don't know what I believe. Okay, well, that's intellectual. A lot of these people today in our society and what our kids are being taught in our public schools and our universities is the fact that Christianity is the non-thinking man's religion. Okay? But I want to take a stand and I want us to discover in this passage of Noah's experience that his faith was firmly rooted in fact. Our faith is not something out of a best-selling book written on a man's perspective or intellect. The Christian faith is not just some tradition that's been handed down to me from my grandma and grandpa, but my faith is an experience and it's a relationship with a living God based upon his eternally established word. You see, in order to be a Christian, you have to believe that this is the infallible word of God or you can't even begin to serve. Of God because everything about our faith is founded in the scripture. That's why it says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Martin Luther once said this quote, If you're going to be a believer, you must, crucif you must crucify the question, Why? Now that's a good thought. If you've ever read the history of the Reformation, you remember the story how that Martin Luther was brought before the Roman Catholic Council because he had proposed 95 questions that he demanded answers to. They told him to apologize or recant or else he would be excommunicated from the church. You know the story. Martin Luther had gotten into the Word. He began reading the book of Romans in the Word of God. It got into his spirit, and it illuminated him to the understanding that salvation was not by baptism or works or punishing your body or the sacraments, but the just shall live by faith. And he discovered that you could have a personal relationship with God by faith. You didn't have to go through a priest. You didn't have to go through a mediator. You didn't have to have anybody else to give you access to God. You could approach the throne of God 
yourself through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Martin Luther said that when they were about to excommunicate him, here's what he said, I cannot recant unless convinced by Scripture and right reason. Notice the priority. First, revelation, the Holy Scripture. And then second, right reason. So let me just add here that reason always bows before the bar of revelation. Because in our pseudo-religious society today, we will have difficulty persuading men on the facts of divine revelation. You know, you can talk to people about things that happen in your experience with God that really are indescribable in words or the human mind just cannot put its head around it. Just uh, when, when we began this journey three, three or four weeks ago, one of our sisters in the Lord that was here in that service has been fighting cancer, and she gave the testimony about how that the doctors basically had given up and she was supposed to die a few months ago, and yet she's strong and she's, she's experiencing health right now, and she gave all praise to God. And, and it was by faith that she held on tenaciously to what? To the prescriptions that the doctors write? No. She held on tenaciously to this unshakable kingdom, this unshakable word, the word of God, that the Bible says is forever settled in heaven. That's why it's settled in heaven. That's why the writer says uh, we have to pray Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You see, I have a message, in call, and it's entitled, Heaven Has Been Waiting on Earth. Okay? When we understand how to get things that are already done and finished in heaven and get them manifested here in earth, that's when we start seeing signs and miracles and wonders that blow people's mind. But how do we get there? By faith. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Noah was operating in the unseen. Because in Hebrews eleven seven 7, it says that Noah warned about things not yet seen. So, people, especially young adults today, they struggle with revelation. They respond by saying that they just can't handle the rigidity of, re of divine revelation. They, they can't understand how that walking down an aisle in a church building and kneeling in an altar and confessing your sins before an invisible God brings about some kind of supernatural, mysterious, radical change in one's life. They say that's just too restrictive for their life. Well, my answer to that is simply this. There are also certain divine laws and principles that regulate the divine economy of Almighty God. How many of you know you can go downtown to the Hilton Hotel, take the elevator to the eighth floor, you can go into a room, you can open a window, and you can jump out. And you're free to do that. But once you get out of that window... You're no longer free, are you? What do you mean? You are free to make the choice. You are free to jump. But as soon as you become airborne, there is another law that you will become subject to, and it's called the law of gravity. And that law will bring you down whether you believe in it or not. And the only thing that you will be is a greasy spot on the pavement. Can I hear an amen? You may not like the law. You didn't vote for the law. You may not even understand the law. And you may want, not even want to discuss it. But it will take its toll on your life. And that's the way it is with God's law. I like the way that Moses said it. 
God hath thus spoken. Now let me tell you how we respond. Well, if God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Baloney. If God said it, that settles it. Can I hear an amen? Whether I believe it or not. He spoke clearly and distinctly. And if you have any intentions of going to heaven, you're you're going to have to go God's way. Just like the ark in this story in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9 was the only means of salvation for that generation in Noah's day, Jesus Christ is the only means of salvation in our times today. In fact, in John 14, it was Jesus that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He made every other way a dead-end street. He made all other truth a lie. He made every other path a way of death and destruction. And what I love about Noah is what God provided, Noah accepted. Wow, if we could have a house full of people like that in the church. What God provided, Noah accepted. I've thought about how it must have been a lot of people are under the impression that that they were only in the ark maybe for 40 days and 40 nights. Not so. That's That's how many days it was raining. Okay, stay with me. Noah's family was in that ark for probably over a year. Now, today we like to take cruises, don't we? Well, before the pandemic we did. Now, I don't like cruises. I get seasick even on big ships. The last cruise that my wife and I went on was three and a half years ago, and it was on a great big, the, one of the newest, biggest ships, the Oasis of the Sea. And uh, I, out of the seven-day trip, I spent four days in the cabin, sick, like this. It's not a good feeling. I can imagine that if Noah's boys were like most boys today, they began to suffer from cabin fever after a while being in that ark. And I think I can kind of hear them discussing the matter with their father. Hey, you know, Dad, it sure is smelly in here. Remember, there were two of every kind. You know, you ever lived or been by a chicken farm? My papa used to raise pigs. Woo-hoo! Suey, suey. Okay, you ever been around a pig farm or a or a chicken farm? And just think about this for a minute. They're on a boat for a year. Well, first question I have is where'd they get enough food to sustain all those animals? Did you ever think about that? And then you know what goes in has to come. Yeah. So, Dad, it's kind of smelly in here. It's kind of cramped quarters in here. And after, (laughs) I love this, after a while of whining and complaining, Noah probably had enough of it and said to those boys, Look, it's the best boat afloat. Well, actually, it was the only boat. God has made his way plain to man, and Jesus is the only way to God and to heaven. He's not just the best way. He's the only way. And I'm talking about the facts of our faith, that intellectual component of our faith. I don't come here to this church Sunday after Sunday just to get you believe, to believe something. I come here to get to you to believe the truth. Paul encapsulated the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 in such a beautiful way, and he sets, the, he sets forth the facts of our faith. There are four of them. I don't know if they're in your notes or not. But it says, first, Christ died for our sins. Secondly, that he was buried. Thirdly, that he was raised from the dead. And fourthly, he was seen alive after his resurrection. And I want you to notice four facts. First, there was the death of Christ. That's a fact. Then, Jesus was buried. That's a fact. He was raised from the dead. That's a fact. 
and he was seen by man after his death and resurrection. He was seen by men after his death. We are not, listen to me, we are not asking people to believe something that has no historical credence, but we're asking them to believe something that's built upon facts that are found in the living Word of God of Almighty. No preacher has preached the gospel until you have given the congregation something to believe. One of the needs of our day is for accurate biblical preaching and teaching of the gospel that is based on historical fact. But so much of our preaching today is about making you feel good and think better about yourself and how to have a happy marriage and need I go on. And yes, those are subjects that are addressed in the Scripture, but what happened? Today we've compromised the message. We've watered down the Word. We've given in to societal pressure. Because people, when they come to church for 59 minutes, they want to feel good. You see, folks, coming to this house of worship is not about you just feeling good. You know that if you can, tend to, can attend a church for a, even a few weeks and your toes don't get stepped on or your mail isn't being read or your heart is not being convicted, you might need to find you another church. Seriously. Verse 7, by faith, being warned of God about things not yet seen. This is what I want you to grab. God requested of Noah to do something that seemed ridiculous in the human realm, but it was revealed to him spiritually. We don't have to understand everything about faith to be the recipients and the benefits and the blessings of faith. I'd like for you to go and to get a hold of some truth right here. To the human mind and reasoning, it was illogical and to simple and foolish to walk down the aisle when you felt convicted of the Holy Spirit for your sin and to bend your knee and confess your sin to an invisible God who's going to forgive you of that sin. Well, let me tell you something. I've come along tonight to tell you that that still works. Jesus Christ still saves, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He said, whoever confesses with his mouth and believes in his heart, the same shall be saved. Noah didn't have any empir in, empirical data. There was no past record of a flood before. The Weather Bureau wasn't confirming a flood. But God said there's going to be a flood. And by faith, Noah accepted it and he believed it. And immediately, what did he do? He started working on the project. Immediately. Immediately. I like what Arthur Pink says in his commentary on Hebrews. Let me read it to you. Human reason was altogether opposed to what God had made known to Noah. Hitherto there had been no rain, according to Genesis 2 and 6. Then why expect an overflowing deluge or a flood? It seemed utterly unlikely that God would destroy the whole human race and His mercy 
would be utterly swallowed up by avenging justice. The threatening judgment was a long way off, 120 years. And during that time, the world might repent and even reform. When he preached to men, nobody believed his message. Why then should he be so fearful whatever, whenever everybody else was at ease? I mean, to build this ark with such a huge dimensions was an enormous undertaking and would evoke the scoff of his fellows. And even if the flood came, how would you know if the ark would float with such immense burden? It had no anchor to stay her, no mass or sail to steady her, no steering wheel to direct her. It was, was it not quite impractical for Noah? Because he was inexperienced nautically. Moreover, for him and his family to dwell for an indefinite period in a sealed ark was far from a pleasant prospect under flesh and blood. But against all of these carnal objections, faith offered a steady resistance and believed God. Wow. Can you say amen to that? I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine the first day that Noah comes home after he's been talking with God and God had revealed to him what was going to take place and he gets all of the family together for a little meeting and says, well, guys, he's sitting around the, the dinner table with Mrs. Noah and his sons and I want to tell you what God told me today. He said he was going to send a flood. What? He's going to send what? And Noah replied, God is sending a flood and every living soul is going to be annihilated and obliterated from the earth and God has instructed me, Noah, to build an ark to save our family and anyone else that wants to get on board. God told you what? Noah, you've been out in the sun too long, buddy. No, Noah had enough credibility with his family. Are you listening to me? Listen to me. Noah had enough credibility with his family that when he told them what God had said to him, they believed him, Jesse. The wife didn't bull up and get in his face about it. The kids didn't rebel. No. No. Here's what I want you to understand. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if this thing that we call faith and Christianity doesn't work at home, it doesn't work anywhere else. That's some good teaching right there. If it doesn't work at home, it doesn't work anywhere. Notice not only the intellectual component of our faith, but there's also another component. Look at this in your notes. Secondly, there's an emotional component. You know, I think, I, 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 you've probably heard this before, and when we talk about emotional in Pentecostal churches, you know, we're like, yeah. I heard somebody say this, Pentecostals will make it to heaven if they don't run past it. That's about the truth, isn't it? Look at verse 7 again. By faith, Noah being warned of God of the things not yet seen, and then underline the next three words, moved with fear. Fear is a great emotion, isn't it? How many of you have ever been afraid? And fear can be positive or negative, can't it? So let's blast a little before we build here because of so much spongy thinking. There's a lot of sloppy perspective on who God is. And when the Bible says that Noah was moved with fear, we're not talking about the cringing, crippling, quaking fear. No. We're talking about a reverential awe, like He was moved with fear. He was moved with oh. 
for the authority of God. Noah had respect for God and for his word. Many people today have a warped perspective of God when it comes to fearing him. And too many people go around afraid that if they just get one degree off center, God is going to zap them. They're afraid that they're going to offend God. It's as though that they're walking this tightrope over hell. And friend, that's misery. That's not the kind of life that God has called us to. God does not want you or anybody to have that kind of opinion of him. So, Very much so. Why? Because we... Yes, sir. Yet too many Christians, they are not enjoying their relationship with God because they don't think that they can be good enough, nor do they think they can ever please God. That's not how he wants us to live. We're not to live in trembling fear of a negative type, but we are to walk in faith, and yes, without fear, we, we, we will never have the respect and the, and the reverence for God. But notice that there are two kinds of fear. The Bible says he's not given us a spirit of fear. That's the kind that is evil, the kind that is, is motivated by darkness. No, we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and we love not our light, life even unto the death. And when we fear, the Bible says in the Old Testament, I believe it's in Ecclesiastes, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You see, there's a difference between being afraid and fearing God. John Bevere has one of the best books out. Maybe you've ever read it. It's called The Fear of the Lord. It is so powerful. If you've never read it, I encourage you to do so. I hope that you can understand what I'm trying to get across to you. God is not not some incompassionate being with this oozy just waiting to blow you away if you get a quarter of a point off center. I'm talking about a relationship with God that will be an emotional experience, one that we are to enjoy. So many people, unfortunately, have this terrible concept as if God is looking down from his throne and he says, all right, Brian, are you enjoying yourself? Gabriel, give me the club. I don't want anybody. People have the concept that God doesn't want anybody enjoying themselves. Oh, are you laughing? Cut it out, quit. Why? Laughter doeth good like a medicine, the Bible says. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So why do people have this concept that, you know, when you come to church, you can't move, you can't talk, you can't raise your hands, you can't lift your voice, you can't clap, you can't... Why? Do you know that the house of God should be the most joyful place in the whole planet? That is correct. Amen. This should be the happiest place on the earth, not Disney World. Because you know what I believe? The only people on earth that have the right to rejoice today, it's not the person, the average person that's driving down the expressway to go to work, but it's those of us who have been blood-bought who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, who are safe and secure and we're here. God wants us to rejoice and to be glad in Him. And I think when some people get to heaven, that God is going to say, hey, you know, I'm glad you made it. But I'm really sorry you didn't enjoy the trip. You'll get that in a minute. Why? There's supposed to be joy in this journey. It bugs me to get around Christian people who believe that motion, emotion should never be a part of our experience with God. But let me tell you something. I don't want to serve a God that isn't touched by my emotions and by the feelings of my infirmities. Just one day, Jesus leapt up off the pages of God's Word, and I've, I've never recovered from it yet. In John 10, what does he say? I've come 
that you might have life and have it to the fullest, have it more abundantly, an enjoyable life, really living, joy unspeakable and full of glory. The half has not even yet been told. What's happened to so many Christians is that they have never advanced in their faith beyond the intellectual realm. They just have a nice set of facts, but those facts have never moved them. There are some folks that don't have an emotional component to their faith. I've heard the question debated, how do we get people motivated, pastor, and off the dime? Well, get them back into the power of God. What do you mean? You ever seen a person backed up into 40,000 volts of electricity? They're not going to say, I feel something. They're going to move and shake, are they not? How many of you have ever hung wallpaper? It's not, it's not a real commodity today. Back in 20, 30 years ago, we wallpapered everything, even the woodwork. We wallpapered everything. But unless you're really sanctified, you really should never hang wallpaper, especially in a kitchen or a bathroom. If you want to test your sanctification, then do it. I know you shouldn't do this, but when, you, when you're doing wallpaper, now, now I understand today they have self-sticking or self-adhesive, but in the old school days, we'd, we'd have to fill up the tub about this much with water, and we'd have to go in and we'd cut the wallpaper dry, and then we had to come and lay the wallpaper. And you're not, y'all, y'all looking like you know what I'm talking about. You lay it down the tub, and you fold it over, and you let the paste get all moist and gooey and gummy, and what do you do? Then you take it, and you start at the top, And you try to get it lined up with, oh, God, if you ever had to have the design match, that was was torture. And then you know what I would do? It's because you wanted to cut a a perfect hole around the electric socket. Y'all know where I'm going? And you take that little razor knife, and you're doing like this just to make sure, and this is it! And you touch that socket. Brother, you don't say, I feel so. No, you do not. You jump up and you shout. Let me mention two or three things more about this emotional component of our faith, and I'm going to bring it to a close. The married folks here tonight will really understand what I'm saying. But those of you that are not married will have to take what I'm saying by faith. Love and faith are certainly never blind. Love is intelligent. Biblical love, that is. And I'm talking about emotions. Biblical faith is intelligent, but it always demands an expression. Love demands expression. Do you married people agree? Do you remember for the, before the marriage how that he used to open the door for you and after the wedding he wouldn't, he would reply, is your arm broke? Why are y'all laughing? <laughs> what happens after the marriage? The emotional component comes to a screeching halt. Love demands expression. Do you know what I, you know what I love about our church? We love to express our love to one another. I love that. I'm a hugger. I'm a shaker. I love to, I love to embrace people and and express my love to one another. And this is what Jesus said about the apostolic church. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You've heard the story of the couple in divorce court when the judge asked the wife why they were getting divorced, and she replied, quote, because my husband never tells me he loves me anymore. And the husband replied, quote, I told her I loved her once, and if anything changed, I'd let her know. Well, that's kind of stinking thinking. 
And unfortunately, that same thing is filtered over into our spiritual marriage with Christ. It happened with the church at Ephesus, didn't it? Didn't he tell them that you've lost your... You've read it. You've lost your first love. What did he tell them to do? Go back and do your first works over. Go back and start opening the door for Crystal when she gets in the car. And I won't even talk to you. What are you saying, Pastor? Love expresses itself. Love demands expression. Jesus told them in Ephesus that they didn't love him because they were no longer expressing the love to him like they used to. So I can kind of hear him saying, well, you know, Lord, I loved you back in 1948 when you saved me. Church, there has to be an emotional component working in our faith for it to please God. And what I like about Noah is that he was a mover and a shaker. He was moved by fear. Not the kind of fear that caused him to run, but the kind that caused him to respect. He had that kind of faith that never caused him to cringe, but to commit. And so there is an intellectual component, and there is an emotional component, and I want to close with this. There's a volitional component. Now what does that mean? Volitional component. In verse number 7, look what it says. Noah Moved by fear, there's the emotion, prepared an ark. I submit to you tonight in closing that Noah, despite the fact that he had revelation, would have perished with the rest of the world if he had not done what he was instructed to do by building an ark. Do you understand? No, I want you to think about this. You and I would not be here today if Noah had not obeyed God. No, does, do you get that? The human race would have been eradicated from the earth. All surviving humans die because of the flood. If Noah, Noah chose to put his faith to work in obedience to the Word of God. He didn't quit until the project was finished. That was 120 years. And we think we have it difficult if we have to have, if we have to live 70 years and get this finished and get, get, get to the end of our faith. You know what Peter called Noah? A preacher of righteousness. Noah would preach while he was building. And I'm done with this. We've looked at the essentials of his faith, but what about the effects of his faith? Two minutes. Three groups of people, I want you to think about this. Three groups of people were affected by Noah's faith. First of all, his family, then his society, and himself were all revolutionized by Noah's faith. Hey, Noah, I can hear the Church of God Statistical Department in Cleveland, Tennessee calling and saying, Hey, Noah! How many, did you, how many people did you have saved in your 120-year revival? Seven. Seven? You mean to tell me, Noah, after 120 years of obedience and preaching, you only saved seven people? You mean seven last week. Seven. You mean to tell me that you only had seven souls saved in 120 years? Who were they, Noah? Well, honestly, they, they were just my immediate family. Listen to me. What good is it to me if I can get all of your kids and all of your grandkids saved and my son goes to hell? Oh, think about that. You see, by man's standards, Noah was a failure. But by God's standards and balances, he succeeded. 
God doesn't use the same scales that we use, does he? Look again at who it is that Noah saved. He saved himself and his family. But notice also, Terrace, he saved the entire human race. So first of all, our faith has to worship. That was Abel. Secondly, our faith has to walk right. That was Enoch. And tonight we've talked about how our faith has to work. Next week we will conclude our study on Abraham and how our faith has to wait. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for those that you've assembled in this Bible study. And I pray that we've been discipled. I pray that we have grown in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ somehow, some way, that something that has been said will inspire, will edify those that have heard tonight the message. And I just ask God that that we can operate and live with a balanced faith, a faith that worships, a faith that walks right, a faith that worships and works, and a faith that waits. And God, that our faith would be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, thank you for being here tonight. We got one more week in this study. I ordered, let me tell you, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of where we're headed in January. I know that's a few weeks off, but in January when we relaunch, I've been asking the Lord, God, show me what do I need, what do I need to share in the new year, the first quarter, the 12 weeks, and I found out the Holy Spirit revealed it to me today. Starting in January, I'm going to be preaching on the Bible, sexuality, and culture. I'm very excited because this is a discussion that many people are afraid to have in the pulpit, but is so necessary. So I want you to be praying for me. I've never done this study before. It's brand new. I'm, I'm getting information. I'm compiling notes, and I believe that it is necessary. How do we raise our family in this culture? So I hope that you'll get the word out. First week in January, we're going to launch this brand new 12-week study. God bless you. I love you. Look forward to seeing you Sunday at 1030. Let me also remind you, Saturday night at 7 o'clock, you need to get here early because this place probably will be packed to the gills. Okay? The music musician's world is hosting a free concert here. Does anybody know who... Um, Michael Todd is the pastor of Transformation Church. It's a huge, mega church, powerful man of God. His worship team is going to be here putting on a concert for free Saturday night, 7 o'clock. Come out, come early in order to get a seat because this has been announced in all of East Texas, and they're going to be utilizing our facility, and I hope that you'll join us 7 o'clock on Saturday night for this awesome concert. God bless you. Have a great rest of the week.